Good afternoon, everyone. Father Henry Wisnant here from St. Mary's Warrington to re-record the sermon from today's Palm Sunday Mass. We apologize to everyone for the ongoing difficulties with the live streaming. Um, interestingly, some of the men listening to the Mass today, finding that they couldn't hear anything, decided to say a prayer to St. Michael the Archangel and found that the audio was able to be heard once again. So this, I think, just reinforces that the evil one hates what's going on here, that in some way the liturgy for this week is being shared with the faithful. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want the graces that can come through that. So let's bear that in mind. Let's have patience and let's pray against the work of the evil one through the intercession of Our Lady, St. Joseph, and the saints, especially St. Michael, the Archangel. Just before the sermon itself, I'll give you the announcements that Father de Mallory made before the sermon today. First of all, do continue to tune in to Live Mass for the Triduum itself. We, we think that now everything should be back on course um, with the technology, uh, certainly for the Triduum, especially with your prayers. So do take part as much as you can in the Sacred Triduum itself, Monday, Thursday, uh, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday, and obviously the weekdays this week, as far as you're able to join in with us. Secondly, if anyone would like to go to the Sacrament of Confession, it wouldn't be in the church, uh, but it would be somewhere on the premises, they're able to do so by arrangement, so to phone up or email, and we can arrange a time when you can come in to make your confession before the Triduum, indeed even uh, during it. But better if people don't come all at the very end of the week, obviously, and if some come even in these um, first days of the week now, just so that we have enough time to see those who would like to come for confession. And thirdly, do continue to support the Shrine, even if you're not able to come uh, physically. You know that the Shrine uh, takes a lot of money to keep up going to keep um, in in good state and so do continue to to aid the shrine financially you can do that by going on the support page of fssp.co.uk now for the sermon of the mass in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost amen plodima torba the greatest multitude. We heard these words in the gospel at the beginning of today's liturgy, the gospel of Christ's entrance into Jerusalem and our entrance into this holy week. Plodima Torba. A very great multitude spread their garments in the way, and others cut boughs from the trees and strewed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Plurima Torba. But where is this great multitude now? At the start of Mass today, we had the procession, we had the palms, but where was the multitude? It was not there. You, the faithful, were not there. You were dispersed, locked out, forbidden from entering. On such a momentous day, at the beginning of such a momentous week, what does this mean? How do we make sense of it? Perhaps until now, we've only explained it partially. Up to now, we may have said, it's the virus that has emptied our churches. Or it's the government, they closed the churches. Or it's the bishops who asked that the churches be closed. Or their advisor, the one who convinced the government to close them. He is responsible. All of these have some truth, but they are only partial explanations. Because such a thing has never happened in living memory, indeed even in history, that the vast majority of the churches in the developed world have been shut down in the most sacred and solemn time of the church's year. And yet, and yet, God has allowed this to happen. In such a singular circumstance, it's not enough to name its immediate causes 
what philosophy calls efficient causes, that is, the disease or the people who put the ban in place. We need to look at the deeper cause, what philosophers call the final cause. For what purpose did God allow the coronavirus to close our churches? What is he teaching us in all this? Surely God is teaching us through this catastrophe what he has been teaching since the beginning of Lent liturgically, that is, the need for repentance and purification. Purification for our own sins, but also vicarious purification for the sins of our world, which has merited nothing more than the affliction it is presently experiencing. One bishop, speaking about the present crisis, has said, The coronavirus epidemic, in my view, is without doubt a divine intervention to chastise and purify the sinful world and also the church. This is not just his view, it's the view of the Missal itself. For if you go and look up in the Missal, the vote of mass in time of pestilence, you will see that it prays for the pardon of God's people and refers to the pestilence as God's punishment, iracundiae tue flagella, the scourges of thy wrath. As distasteful as such a conclusion might be to our modern sensitivities, we cannot deny its plausibility when we look at our society today. The incessant attacks on God's natural law, the erosion of the God-given institution of marriage and the family, and the obscuration of our God-given sexual identity, the promotion of a promiscuous contraceptive lifestyle, especially to the young, the ever more blasphemous experimentation with human embryos, the stealthy advance of euthanasia, the ever rising number of abortions in our land, in their several hundreds every day. From the news we learn that the children of darkness, who never sleep, are even making use of this epidemic to extend the permissions for medical abortion so that now they can take place in the confines of the home, without even the efforts of the woman going to a clinic. Such are the priorities of government legislation at this time. And that's not even considering the materialism and greed of our culture, its systematic atheism, the ubiquitous presence of impurity, profanity and blasphemy in the mainstream media, our benign attitude to a persuasive culture of drugs, the routine dishonesty and personal slander that frames so much of public and political discourse. All of this is long overdue for chastisement from God in the form of the virus and the consequent restrictions that we are experiencing, so that our society might read the signs and repent and turn back to him. And we, the church, living in the world, must also suffer with the world, and in this way make atonement for the world. But of course the church too, in the sins of her members, has merited this chastisement, the deprivation of public worship in these solemn days. For how easily the members of the church, her baptized faithful, and even at times her leaders, have grown accustomed to the pagan ways of our age, to think, speak, and live as the world thinks, speaks, and lives. Too many Catholics have made idols of pagan cultures and of the earth itself. They have thought more of human respect than of God's rights. They have no platform every form of perceived discrimination, but happily tolerated heresy and habitual irreverence by which God is discriminated against. And so God has removed from the church, at the time when she most keenly feels it, the consolations that she has grown so used to receiving from his hands, as a reminder that even these blessings are not something that he, strictly speaking, owes to us, but something, rather, that he in his goodness grants us and that he can take away. Finally, in permitting this virtual interdict, this ban on the regular sacramental and liturgical life of the church at the most sacred time of her year, God is saying something important, not just to the world and to the church, but to each one of us personally. In the empty churches across our land, he's teaching us to see the stark reality of our own abandonment of God in this coming week. 
For by our many sins, each and every one of us, in truth, deserted him to his passion and death. Today, we would like nothing more than to be the great crowd, the Plurima Turba, that welcomes the Lord with palm branches. And yet, come Friday, we will send the Lord Jesus to mount the dead branches of the cross. Today, we would gladly gather to see him ride a beast into Jerusalem. But where will we be on Friday when he is driven from Jerusalem as a beast of burden, carrying our sins on his shoulders? Of him, King David, in today's tract, prophesies, I am a worm and no man, the reproach of men and the outcast of the people. Perhaps then, for one year, we can let the Lord teach us by this singular Palm Sunday. By a strange providence, he forces us to abandon him liturgically, so that we might remember and weep for the fact that we willingly abandon him by our sins. We, the Plodima Torba, the great crowd, were simply not there when our blessed Lord most needed us. And now it remains for us, the scattered multitude, to behold him this week, making his lonely way up the hill, bearing the branches of the tree of sacrifice. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.